Cousin Billy got it, but no, we actually got that. Brought it home. Okay, Aunt Esther's going to tell us a little about this the photograph. She can remember this when my dad was courting my mother. Yeah. When he first started to come, he'd bring that little photograph with him, you know, set it up, and he had several of those cylinder records and saying, oh, we were so happy as younger kids, and then we knew he was coming, you know. But we hopefully he'd bring that along, because he did, you know, and we really enjoyed that. That would really be an antique today. The phonograph hasn't been played for over 35 years, and I began to wonder if it still would. Needed some lubrication and tinkering, but the cylinder began to turn. Quality is pretty poor, and you may have to turn up the sound to hear it. For the younger generation, the player is not powered by electricity but by a wound steel spring and a set of gears below the cylinder and another set of gears to the left of the cylinder. With their adult children, we have Doris, Jenny, son-in-law Larry Grice, Mabel, Ralph, Lorraine, grandson Ted Grice, Don, daughter-in-law Aletha, and Art, taken in Vernonia, Oregon in 1940. Mabel passed away much too young at the age of 59 in May of 1949. Ralph subsequently remarried in 1951 to Cora Vine Semple. Taken in Montana in the 1950s, from left to right are Cora, Ralph, Joanna, Ernest, Fred, and Gertie. Ralph and Cora would move from Vernonia to Portland in 1961. Fred, the youngest child, was born on August 18, 1891, shown here on the left. Fred, as were most men on the plains, an outdoorsman, he was reputed to have been an excellent marksman. Today, we think of hunting as a sport. But being a good shot had survival implications. Coyote hunts were fairly common. They were considered necessary to reduce the coyote population and thereby protecting livestock and poultry. Fred is the tall man in the center front row with the pointed hat holding the front leg of a coyote. Fred married Gertie Overton Reinhardt on August 1, 1915. This is one of my favorite photos. The short young person is actually my grandmother Gertie with young Fred. Written on the photo is the word pals. I don't know if it was considered proper for young ladies of the day to wear pants, but it certainly didn't bother Grandma, as there are several pictures of her in overalls. Fred had taken over the operation of the farm in 1909, and his parents moved to Lexington in 1913. Fred and Gertie remained on the Mahar homestead. Here we see Fred with a team of horses working a field. Er 
early tractors were essentially railroad type steam engines on steel wheels. They were enormous and were used to power thrashers and other equipment. Due to their size, they were generally not suitable for field work. In the 1920s, smaller, lighter tractors like the one pictured here became popular. Fred is shown with his John Deere tractor in 1942. My father, Bill, was born February 24, 1921. Eileen was born August 3, 1925. Pictured here are Bill on the left and Eileen on the right with their grandfather, William Mahar. As mentioned during the Joanna portion, the Depression and Dust Bowl were difficult years. During the 30s, Joanna had moved to Montana and Ralph moved to Oregon. Fred and family lived on the Mahar homestead. People had to do some unusual things to survive the dust, drought, and depression. Eileen Fagan tells us how Fred kept their cattle alive during a year of severe drought. Yes. Of course, with the drought, along with the depression, the pastures were gone. There wasn't enough rain to uh, support any growth of grass and uh, especially during the summer and uh, so my dad uh, got together with Herman Hawk, one of our good neighbors and uh, they along with my brother Bill and and, and uh, Leland Hawk uh, got their cattle together rather than have to sell them at a, a pittance and they of course all knew eventually that the drought had to end and uh, the four fellows got on their horses they all, everyone had riding horses and they drove the cattle south I mean north rather uh, up to the uh, Platte River, and I think the pasture they rented was somewhere near Overton. And they rented a, a pasture there and took their cattle there. The grass was alkaline, but uh, it was good enough to keep the cattle alive, through, especially through that one summer. Dust storms were prevalent on the plains and resulted in the area being called the Dust Bowl, represented here by the black cloud on the map. This is Napanee, Nebraska, which is about 60 miles south and east of Elwood, taken on April 26, 1935. Another dramatic picture of Dodge City, Kansas, taken April 14, 1935. The aftermath of the storms was amazing. Here is a 1935 South Dakota photo. Eileen Fagan recalls a memorable dust storm she experienced. Well. I remember the dust bowl. It wasn't as severe in, uh, here as it was farther south. But I do remember the dust storms. One huge one in particular. The teacher could see the cloud coming, obviously, and uh, told all of us to hurry home. And of course that was a mile and a quarter walk from school to the farm. But I can remember looking to the south and southwest and seeing this huge, huge brown cloud. And I hurried home. Uh, 
Bill was in high school. Fred and Gertie lived on the homestead until 1943, when my father and mother took over operation of the farm. In 1943, Fred and Gertie moved from the farm to this house in Elwood, Nebraska. Fred worked at a grain elevator and then for a farm implement dealer. In 1947, Fred purchased an interest in the Elwood Coal and Lumber Company, where he worked until retirement in 1956. Upon retirement, Fred and Gertie moved back to the farm to live for a few years until health reasons necessitated their move to Lexington, Nebraska. Grandpa Fred loved to fish. Here he is in front of the garage at the farm around 1956 with all of his grandsons after a successful day at the lake. From left to right are Bob Mahar, Grandpa Fred Mahar, John Fagan, Ben Fagan Jr. and me. Based upon the size of the catch, it appears that Ben Jr. had the most successful day. Fred and Gertie made their final home together in Lexington, Nebraska in 1959. Gertie would eventually need the care of a nursing home. Gertie passed away in the Lexington Hospital on March 25, 1968. Sadie Major, as explained in the first DVD, was the eighth child and youngest daughter of David and Virginia Major. Her mother passed away after the birth of the tenth child and Sadie was cared for by William and Catherine. Though not formally adopted, Sadie is the child seated between William and Catherine. She was born July 1, 1901. Here's what Don and Esther have to say about Sadie. Okay, now he's going to say that this Ernest Major, who married my Aunt Josie, my father's oldest sister, had a younger sister, quite a little younger, about the age of Aunt Esther, she says. Now, can you tell uh, us how come that this uh, Sadie Major came to live with my folks? Yeah, I can, because I can remember your dad telling me that uh, uh, after it was either the mother or father passed away, the last one, by uh, the rest of the boys, they used to visit with your grandparents quite a bit anyway. They brought Sadie there because she was smaller, you know. How about Raleigh? When, didn't he come to stay a while? Raleigh. Major. You know, there was a... Her... Was Raleigh Major the one that married this uh, old <coughs> Sadie? Anyway, they just brought her there and left her, and your folk, the grandparents just kept her and raised her then. How say. old would Sadie have been at that time? I would know, maybe about 10 or 12, I'd say, something like that. But I know your dad used to tell me about Sadie. Now, anyway, this uh, Sadie... Major came to live with my grandparents, uh, Billy and Kate Mahard, as we mentioned, and that uh, she, she, that answer said she must have came there when she was about 10 or 12 years old, and she stayed with them, Curtis, she graduated from high school. In fact, when she went through high school, she used the name Mahar. Yeah, I think she did. Yeah. Yeah, I think she did. And then she married a fellow named Sykes, when it, Clifford yeah, Sykes, and they moved to Kenosha, Wisconsin. And the last time I seen her was when my grandfather Mahar passed away in about 1930 or 31, it was. Do you know if they and, still alive? Yeah. They had a son that was killed during the war. Well, Remember that? And then this, what they call the shorty, they called him, I think, Sykes, didn't they? Uh -huh. Yeah, he, he died some time ago, too. I don't know a lot about Sadie and have no other pictures of her as a child. In a family photo with the Smiths, Sadie, as a young lady, is the second person from the left. Sadie M. Mahar is found in the 1920 Nebraska Census. She is 19 and is a teacher in the country school boarding with the Chris A. Christensen family. As 
As mentioned earlier, Sadie married Clifford Sykes of Kenosha, Wisconsin on June 8, 1921. Kenosha is located between Milwaukee and Chicago on Lake Michigan. Sadie is pictured here with a baby. We believe the child is Richard, making this photo taken in 1922, the year Richard was born. They had three children, Richard, Eileen, and Clifford E. Sykes. Pictured here in 1937 are Eileen, Clifford, and Richard Sykes, who would have been 15 at the time. Richard was killed in World War II. Taken at the same time as a previous photo in 1937 are Sadie and Clifford Sykes. Sadie is obviously a proud grandma with granddaughter Kathleen Sykes, Clifford Jr.'s daughter. The three siblings taken in Montana in the 1950s, this may very well have been the last time they were together in one place. Ralph passed away on November 19, 1963 in Portland, Oregon. Fred would move in with my folks Bill and Betty Mahar until his passing on November 17, 1964 in Lexington, Nebraska. Joanna passed away on January 31, 1966, in Ekalaka, Montana. Before his death, Ralph was instrumental in helping establish the Mahar Park near Vernonia, Oregon. Ralph purchased the property on March 27, 1946, for $2,000. entrance and yours truly. Here Jenny tells us about the formation of the park. All right. In uh, 1962, and I think maybe before that, Dad had thought about it and I wanted to we're gonna go. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> oh, we're not leaving yet. We're just giving you kisses. <laughs> anyway, in 1962, um, he came up with the concept, and I think hopefully through Don on her, uh, they went to a lawyer and got all the um, information that they would need to incorporate. And, uh, it was his vision that this 53 acres of land would become a place where the family could come and, and uh, have for recreational purposes only, not to sell the trees or, or have any other uh, way of raising money. It's, it's just a, a place to be. And uh, so they went to the attorney and got the papers signed up. And, his dream has come true because it now is, and since that time, we've had the annual meetings 